Hello everybody and welcome to a very special bonus episode. Once again, we're here with the Movie Mass Debate. Joined by some other amazing shows, movie reviews in 20 Qs, the Countdown Movie and TV Review Podcast, Shake and Not Nerd, and the Movie Journey Podcast, formerly known as the IMDb Journey Podcast. It was a ton of fun. We decided with the release of Rise of Skywalker coming out later this week that we would tackle one of the most divisive movies of the decade, The Last Jedi. It was a ton of fun. I hope you enjoy listening to it, and we'll be back on Thursday with our regular episode on Rise of Skywalker. Thanks, everybody. Welcome to the Movie Masturbate, where a bunch of your favourite podcasters from below the equator get together and fight over some iconic films, and whether they deserve the praise or criticism they may deserve. My name is Daniel Henderson of the IMDb Journey Podcast, and I'll be your judge, jury, and executioner today. (laughs) And with the upcoming release of one of the biggest films of the year in Star Wars Episode Nine: The Rise of Skywalker, I thought what better film to cause long-term rivalries over than the highly diverse Star Wars Episode Eight: The Last Jedi. Now, pretty much the same as last time, we have four rounds for you today. The first three are specific categories with one member of each team acting as a positive and a negative debater. The categories are characters, plot and pacing, and the techs, with the fourth round being an all-out brawl. The first three rounds will be worth a point each, with the final round being worth two points. I'll be awarding the points based on creativity, passion, rebuttal, and overall effort. I chose The Last Jedi not only because of the timing, but because I'm a partial observer to this film. I've only seen it once way back in the day when it came out. I'm very middling on it, and I stayed away from all the controversy it created online at the time. So my mind is basically a blank slate. So feel free to fill it with your masturbating skills, whether it's a premature victory or a slow burn with a massive finish. I'm sure someone will have a happy ending. (laughs) So let's introduce our teams. We have, first of all, the positive posse. And going through in alphabetical order, today's captain, I guess, is from We Watched a Thing. It's B Dizzle. How are you, mate? What's up? I'm exceptional, my friends. How are you guys all going? I think we're all doing wonderful. I think I think we're going to have a great, fun debate here today. I think so, too. Good, good clean debate. I'm glad that <laughs> you and Dean aren't against each other again. <laughs> clean, clean is ambitious. I'll give you that. <laughs> <laughs> Next up for the positive posse, judging by last time's results, I think he's. I think it's clear he's a bigger masturbator than me. It's Dean from the IMDb Journey podcast. How are you, mate? Hello, Ed. How are you? Oh, it's good to see you again. Yeah, you too. Yeah. I just want to say that uh, you know you're a great bloke, and uh, I'm happy to <laughs> to be here with you today. <laughs> those, those fuckers are sharing the same room. That shouldn't be right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm actually writing his notes for him as everyone's going to be speaking. <laughs> Hands above the table, guys. <laughs> <laughs> And lastly, for the positive posse, we've got Tofa from We Watch The Thing. He's back and ready to speak with some more positive tones this time. How are you, buddy? I'm very well. How are you all, strangers? Good to be here. We're going along very fine here, I reckon. I think the positive team are going to have a lot more obviously positive things to say, but... Hang on, where, where have we gone? Do we all need to quit? Lost, lost, my, lost I, my train of thought. I think he's terrible. The positive teams are going to be positive, Joker. Uh, really no, don't, 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 don't listen to them, Daniel. I think you're a wonderful host and a fair judge. <laughs> oh, fuck off. <laughs> <laughs> all right, but let's take a look at the Negatrons, and it seems fitting as last time's MVP of the debate. Let's call him Captain Duty. How are you, mate? I'm Grand Captain. Oh, I am a captain, but how are you? Yeah, I'm good. Yeah, thank you for having me again. Oh, absolutely. Next up for the Negatrons is Paul from the Countdown Movie and TV Reviews Podcast. You ready for a battle today, mate? Certainly are, gentlemen. It's great to be here. Should be a lot of fun. A bit worried about sitting behind duty, but we'll see how we go. Hey, mate. There's a reason they call me duty, so keep your mouth closed <laughs> and your nose closed at all times. <laughs> and lastly, he is the masturbating virgin today. He's not had a chance to show off his talents yet. I'm talking, of course, about Sam from the Movie Reviews and 20 Qs Podcast. How are you, buddy? I'm doing good. Out of the judging seat, being introduced last into a masturbate. I can't wait, but fuck this fucking film. <laughs> <laughs> oh, starting off, starting off early. <laughs> Shots fired. <laughs> That's right. I'm pulling my dick out early. I'm fucking sane. <laughs> Now, like I said, these teams were sorted out randomly, which means the opinions that these guys have, uh, they, may not be ne- they may not necessarily be their own. So I'm sure we'll have a, a little chat at the end about what everyone really thinks about the film. But that's being said, let's get into it. Let's start off with round one, and we're into the characters. And for the positive, we've got B Dizzle up against the negative, Duty. So B Dizzle, we'll start off with you. All righty, here we go. Now, firstly, this is a great movie. Rewatching this movie this week... I was honestly, I'm not going to lie, I was surprised at how good it was. 
Ryan Johnson is a fantastic filmmaker and something he does really well with plots, with characters, with everything he does, and we saw this recently in Knives Out, is the way that he subverts your expectations and he does no different here. He's dealing with really well-established characters for the most part, which makes it hard for him to do. And I think that that's why there was a lot of controversy around this film, because Star Wars fans don't like their expectations being shifted. But you look at Luke, for example, he's just had the shits with everything. And in the end of the film, he becomes the exact figure of legend that he spends the entire film mocking Ray for thinking that that's who he is. Every character goes on a journey in this film, even the ones who have been established before. Snoke. Snoke is the classic archetype, big, big bad of a Star Wars film. We've seen him multiple times in Star Wars in characters like Palpatine, for example, and it's never been anything different. What happens to him in this film takes you by such a surprise and is so well executed that I don't think anybody saw it coming. And I think it adds so much to the mystery of what is going to happen in the next film. It really does what a middle film should in building things. Holdo and Poe, for example. So here you've got a well-established character in Poe, from who we know from Force Awakens, and you've got Holdo coming in for the first time. She's ex- she's emblematic of the subversion of expectations that Johnson plays with. She comes in, and at the start, we're all like, who is this bitch telling Poe what to do? We love Poe. He's great. He spends the entire movie being wrong about everything, and we find out that she was right the whole time and was just paying him no heed because she had bigger things to be focusing on. And then she pulls out the coolest move that has ever been shown in a Star Wars movie when she busts through that thing. It's just amazing. I think the characters in this film all have a unique growth and story. It's not just this. It's an ensemble cast without being too focused on the ensemble. And I think that it's masterful. Duty, show me what you got. All right. Uh, well, look, as you said, look, Ryan Johnson is, is continuing on from what's been set in the past with the past, you know, say four of the, the, the Skywalker trilogy in regards to the old school stuff to what he's doing now. But he learnt absolutely nothing when it comes to continuing the characters, of course. Like, look at Luke Skywalker. He's a character who wants to isolate himself like Yoda and Obi-Wan did before him, which makes sense. But he leaves a fucking map to where he can be found. And I've said it <laughs> once, and I'll say it a fucking again. At the end of this film, he pulls out his father's blue lightsaber to which we saw break and smash on screen and Ryan Johnson's defense was he wanted to make Kylo Ren a little bit angry though a lightsaber is a a, a pass it's a it's a gro- it's a growing up thing it's a it's a rite of passage the weapon is your life and rather than using a blue lightsaber why not use the lightsaber that you almost tried to kill your fucking nephew with <laughs> because you sensed a little bit of hate in him episode 6 is all about i sense the good invader i'm going to bring him back when episode Eight is about, oh, he had a bad thought. I'm going to stab the fucker in his, in his sleep. It makes no fucking sense at all. Also, Luke hates the Jedi, yet he lives in a Jedi sanctuary and throws a fucking tantrum when the Jedi sacred texts catch fire. And Mark Hamill has turned around and said he didn't agree with what Ryan Johnson did, but Disney told him to shut up and he went, mm, okay. An actor who's played the character for 40 years, if he says, this doesn't feel right, you listen. Mm. So that just doesn't fucking make sense. Like, let's take a look at Snoke, a great character. Like, let's set up an amazing character and kill them off without any explanation to who they were and who they were, what, what they were going from, anything in general. But dead. It's fucking stupid. Like, Ray, I hate Kylo Ren for kidnapping me. He proed me. He killed my only father figure. And seeing what they're doing to Keanu Reeves... And they did, in this film, what Keanu Reeves and Sandra Bullock did in The Lighthouse. He's a good person. I'll get him to turn. This film is set right after the end of episode seven. Like, Han Solo was still warm. <laughs> And, oh, no, he's, he's a good person. He'll be fine. I'm still upset that my wife broke my Shazam glass four years ago. How can Ray forgive fucking Kylo after 20 minutes of Harrison Ford getting stabbed? It makes no fucking sense, this film. It's like he didn't watch it. This film is Terminator 3 to Terminator 2. You watch the start of Terminator 3, it's like, the Terminator tried to get me when I was 10. You were 13. Like, it's like Ryan Johnson didn't even watch or read or know anything about Star Wars. He goes, I got an idea for a movie. Um, uh, Luke Skywalker throws a lightsaber over, the, over his shoulder and goes, fuck this, and walks up. Like, it, it just it did not make sense. And don't get me started on Rose. She is Cameron Diaz from Gangs of New York. You can edit her out and the film is the same. Mate. <laughs> oh, yes. Brutal. I... I've got pages of notes and they're just the cliff notes. Rose is fantastic. Look at the growth that that Rose and Finn take. The fact that their introduction is her stopping him from deserting. And then by the end of the film, she's stopping him from sacrificing himself. Honestly, Finn should have died at the end of that battle. 
John Boyega's character, he's a stormtrooper who previously worked on sanitation, yet knows the technical schematics of the first of Snoke's first order uh, super star destroyer, and knows how to shut down light speed. Was he listening to audio books while he was cleaning floors or something like <laughs> to take out the uh, super star destroyer? You have to pull out the left plug on the right hand side. Like it just makes no sense at all. Makes he's total not Batman. Sense. He's, he's a stormtrooper who works sanitation, and he also got sliced up his spine. With a lightsaber, and he just walks around in a jacuzzi suit for the first five minutes. <laughs> he should have like robot legs or a robotic spine or something. It honestly makes no sense. Kylo Ren's scar moved across his face because Ryan Johnson said it looked goofy. I'm like, that's the level of attention to detail. I don't like how this looks, how it's been previously shown, and you see how this scar impacts Kylo. I'm just going to move it about three inches to the right so it goes over his eye. So it's fucking, you know, flimsy. Not flimsy, but it's just, you know, like every other action film ever rather than having a different form of scar on a face. It just, this film just. Yeah, it it breaks me. Like, it it breaks me, and it just no, nah, yeah. no, nah, no. Nah, nah. So you made a point about Snoke. Do we know anything about the Emperor? Do we ever find out who the Emperor is? Uh, episode one, episode two, episode three. Star Wars: The Clone Wars, The Rebels. Uh, there is a fuckload of novels, and in regards to what Disney have released in its novel form, which uh, I don't want to brag, but I read a lot of Star Wars novels. They've done nothing with Snoke. Yeah, but they literally had Snoke in a bubble with Luke Skywalker and did nothing with him. But that's what I'm, that's what makes it so interesting is that this character has been done before. We don't need Snoke to be Palpatine. We need Snoke to be Snoke. And the fact that he dies when you don't see it coming is something that we've never seen and will never see again because now no one is going to be brave enough to do something like that in a Star Wars film after the shit Ryan Johnson copped for doing it. But that's like building up like Sauron or Saruman in Lord of the Rings. Like he's this, he's he's a wizard who can beat the living shit out of Gandalf. And then imagine in the second film, within let's say halfway through it, he's killed off, and he's you're like, who was Saruman? No, we don't know. Uh, he was just a white guy in a in a robe. Yeah, and uh, there's a grey guy in a robe. That'd be fucking um, great. It just- it would not be great. It'd be very fucking stupid. Is no, what it because would be. the whole point is that who really who gives a shit who Snoke is? Because at the end of the day, he's yes, he's got this huge presence and he's this big bad, but that's not what it's supposed to be. We're supposed to be more focused on those lower level characters like Kylo, and now he's able to fully take that front stage in the next film. Kylo Ren, the character whose entire arc in this film is let the past die, kill it if you have to, and then, uh, what is it? He destroyed his helmet in this film to super glue it back together like a kid who knocked over a vase. This kid ain't buying what he's selling. <laughs> But that's that's flat out. Human. He's like, I, I drive a Holden. I you know, he sells Holdens, but he drives a fucking Ford Cortina. Like it's a two <laughs> separate things. Like But that's what makes it something- interesting. He's a real human. He's not this two dimensional character. He's he's got growth and depth and he at the end of the day he doesn't even know what he's doing he's a fucking frightened kid who was like nearly murdered by his teacher slash uncle <laughs> And now he just, he doesn't know where he is in the universe. He's trying to figure it out. It's completely fucking super though, because you can't have a character who is essentially the end of the, of, of episode seven, where he killed uh, Han or from what, you know, we as the audience saw that he has stabbed Han and Han is, is dead. Um, and then going on to, I'm going to kill my mother. No, wait, no, I'm not. I'm going to smash a helmet. I'm going to walk around without my shirt on. And then I'm <laughs> going to scream because I can't actually swing a lightsaber and try to hit Luke. He's just, he makes no sense. And I guarantee in the next film, he's going to have the, as much plot development as an orthopedic shoe. He's just going to be, I don't like the Jedi. Maybe I do. I don't know. He he doesn't have that sense of pure hatred and pure anger that if you're going to make a Sith or any form of a dark Jedi, that is how you would do it, rather than just this sitting in the middle going, am I going to do it? It's It makes absolutely no sense in regards to the world that George Lucas has created of there is light, there is dark, there is nothing in the middle. There's no such thing as a grey Jedi. And Kylo is sort of tiptoeing going, well, am I going to go evil? Am I going to go good? I'm Keanu Reeves in the lake house. I'm telling you what I've got to do. Well, that's the thing. We've had, we've had fucking seven episodes of good is good, bad is bad. Let's have some grey area. And are we forgetting about... Luke, Luke's entire arc in the original trilogy is basically about bordering between good and evil. Luke's tri- arc in the, tri- in, in the trilogy, especially after episode five and into six, is all about redeeming his father because he senses the flicker of good on him. And it is the exact polar opposite in episode eight of, I said, he's having a bad dream. I'm going to stab him with a fluoro light that makes noise when I turn it on in Whoa. his sleep. Like that, it, it just makes, it made absolutely no sense. At all. All right, I'm gonna I'm gonna cut it off there. So, uh, well fought between the both of you there. 
Uh, Duty, you definitely came out hard and fast with the facts and the, and the figures, and you were all over this. You almost lost it completely when you mentioned the lighthouse. I was almost <laughs> ready to just cut it off there <laughs> and uh, award the point to, uh, to PDs. That's, that's what a fucking monster. They were talking to each other through the force. It's basically the mailbox. <laughs> you don't have to say the lighthouse. Don't, don't have to say the lighthouse. <laughs> Um, uh, I was waiting, Billy, for you to rebut about the fact that with the Emperor, how they uh, had episode one, two, and three to get some backstory there. You could have thrown out, well, we haven't had the chance to have that backstory yet with Snoke if they wanted to, but you didn't bring that argument back, that rebuttal. I think Duty basically uh, took control of this, and I'm going to award the point to Duty. Disappointing. Yay, Duty! <laughs> Woo! I I, I, w- I will applaud the professionalism on your side compared to my side because I just went into a fucking nerd rage. <laughs> <laughs> that's a first with this film. <laughs> yeah. That's a first for me. All right, that's one point up for the Negatrons. Next round is about the plot and the pacing, and we've got Dean versus Paul. Why don't we uh, Why don't we start with Paul this time for the negative? All right. Well, more than happy to to kick things off. Uh, I'm not sure. Well, I'll, I'll acknowledge this: the first battle, at least it's fun. At least it gets you in the mood and it's exciting and the like. Now, obviously, we can talk about physics and the like through the course of this battle. But what really bothers me, though, is Poe. Poe basically leads a mutiny in the middle of this battle. And the entire rest of the fleet just follows him headlong into battle, despite their commander-in-chief, Leia, screaming, Don't do it. Stop. What are you doing? So, then, when they manage to destroy the Dreadnought at the cost of virtually every other ship other than Poe, and they return to base, he gets a little little tickle on the face from Leia, and a, you're very bad, get in the corner. Which, all right, so now we're not really pa- playing for keeps in this particular movie, that's left me with a bit of a bad taste. But meanwhile, we've got Luke. Now, I know that others are talking specifically about characters, and, and Duty sort of covered a bit of this, so... But he's just, he's just not himself, he's a shadow of his former self, and his instant moment, we end... The Force awakens with Rey reverently handing over the lightsaber to him. And then we come back into this film and he stands there and he holds it. And that's one of the many terrible edits in this film that takes place right there where, where suddenly Rey is about 15 feet away from him rather than right next to him in arm's distance. But that's beside the point. And then he casually throws the lightsaber over his shoulder. And now we have Luke who hates the Force. Luke, who hates the Force, is going to ignore the fact his sister, his one remaining direct relative. Oh, well, obviously, other than Kylo is going to die along with the entire resistance because ah, I'm over the force. Fuck all that. Just doesn't ring even remotely true to his character. Yeah, so uh, so I'm, I'm already now I'm angry. And then we get to fuel in Star Wars. Fuel. Amen. Amen. When have we ever at any point wondered about fuel? When have we moved between impulse and light speed being the only two speed modes here and that certain ships, despite their size and whatever else, can't move faster or slower than other ships? Like, how come this is now suddenly a thing? And I'll tell you why. Because this is just one, basically, it's a chase movie with one ridiculous side plot, which I'll get to in a moment as a thing that makes me second most angry about this film. Speaking of nerd rage, here we go. Then we get Leia. Now, we all know Carrie Fisher tragically died, and we get a moment in this film when Kylo hesitates, can't blow her up on the bridge, but then someone else swoops in and does exactly that. And she, who's had some telekinetic powers, sorry, uh, telepathy only, suddenly is able to survive the vacuum of space. Is able to put this little ring of air around her and fly, fly back to the ship and land back in there again. And the whole purpose of this, apparently, other than Ryan Johnson subverting your expectations, Billy, you said something there that I want to come back to in a moment, is to get her out of the way so we can now get onto the ridiculous Poe continuing to run a mutiny because Holdo won't tell him what's going on. This whole side plot and heading off to this ridiculous casino planet with its stupid horses and its ridiculous code breaker who isn't the code breaker and they find Benicio Del Toro who just happens to be in the cell they get thrown like what the fuck seriously Ryan Johnson seriously you have taken what should have been a two hour film padded out two and a half hours cause you want to have the force be shown at the very end of the film with this one little kid or because you need to give Finn something to do and Finn and Rose, aren't they the most romantic, lovely couple? Don't you just want them to get together? Aren't they the best? That was sarcasm. All right. I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pass it over to <laughs> Dean for his thoughts. Yeah, I'm, 
Hang on, let me let me end with with this. Okay. Can I? This is the big point. <laughs> Billy said Ryan Johnson subverts expectations, and he did do it very well in Knives Out. I will agree, but they're subverting expectations, and then there's like, hey, Star Wars fans, you think you know Star Wars? Fuck you. You think Luke is going to embrace Ray and train her? Fuck you. You think Snoke is a big bad in the series? Ha <laughs> ha. Fuck you. You reckon Ray has some cool ancestral tie to the other films? Oh no. You didn't. Fuck you. You think you know Star Wars? Fuck you. I'm Ryan Johnson and I'm a smug prick who's going to rewrite everything and then I'm going to sit at home and read your Twitter comments and I'm going to reply just enough to stir the plot all while I'm whacking off very generously to this moment of I've taken control. Fuck you. Someone buy this man a beer. Should have got him on the uh, movie Masturbate with us then, I think. <laughs> <laughs> no, um, I mean, you said so much wrong then, Paul. It's embarrassing. But <laughs> let me let me just... We've said, a lot of us have said about subverting expectations and I don't understand how anyone can actually pretend that that is a bad thing. Now, after The Force Awakens came out, yes, a lot of questions were being asked about characters that have all been introduced. We want to know about these people. Obviously, I get that. But the problem is Star Wars has the most, if not the largest, definitely the most vocal fan base and arguably, you know, the most rabid as well. <clears throat> Looking at you, duty. But I think <laughs> how many how many people have actually gone through and said, right, this is what's going to happen in the next two films after The Force Awakens? Heaps. Countless. Now, I'm sorry if you wanted to go to the movies, Paul, sit down and see something that, yeah, I expect to see that. Yeah, I expect to see that. Well done. Oh, I feel good now. I saw exactly what I wanted to say. I'm sorry, but when you open a film like this and the Jedi hero that is Luke Skywalker throws away the lightsaber like it's nothing. I I was glued to the screen. I was gripped at that moment, like, oh my God, I didn't expect this. What could possibly happen now? And we're talking about plot and pacing and stuff like this where things happen out of the blue. It works wonders for pacing. It really keeps your interest up. Same thing with when Snoke dies. Like, I would argue that's the best scene in the movie, uh, that whole you know, Praetorian guard scene. You don't expect Snoke to die there. Like, that is, you know, I draw parallels between the Snoke and Kylo scene there with Vader, Emperor, and Luke in Return of the Jedi. And it's good to have that out of the way now because the way these movies would normally go is you'd spend another two hours leading to this moment where Kylo does something like this at the end. I say, no, let's get it out of the way now. That scene is fantastic. I loved it. All right. Rebuttals. Have at it. I love you, Dean. (laughs) All right. Um, You mentioned you don't like fuel. In being mentioned in Star Wars, can I can I just ask why? Is that do you have a problem with having a movie that tries on some level to be realistic, even if it is <laughs> a space sci-fi? <laughs> that was funny. Well done, Dean. Okay, fair enough. <laughs> it's it's my never point been mentioned exactly. before. The point is this: the point is you're introducing something in film number eight of a nine saga series and now expecting everyone just to bot jump on it it's ridiculous are you saying that ryan johnson shouldn't have introduced anything new in this film paul he shouldn't have introduced fuel dean he definitely should not have it's a dumb it mean it makes everything that's come before it almost null and void it's like well how come none of this has been considered before how come we've had to worry about this now it's to keep the machinations it's a fresh of a voice stupid it's a fresh plot. voice paul we need something new for this franchise it was so like fresh the complaints of it that they've the gone back to yes. jj Abrams. <laughs> well, I mean, we're arguing this film, Paul. Okay, let's not go look to the future, all right? <laughs> but I think uh, you make another point about Poe and his whole storyline there about how he didn't listen to Leia. Like, he is part of the rebels, Paul. He rebels. That's what he does. <laughs> I'm not sure rebellion works if no one doesn't listen to the central voice, but okay. And you complain that what? What, what, what did you want Leia to do when he got back? Kill him? Throw like, him in the brig. hardly any of them left. Throw him He's in the brig. easily their best fighter. Easily their best fighter. What was she meant to do loose, with him? They're not going to hold prisoners. Get rid of him. Get rid of him. <laughs> Oh, God. Oh, and the casino thing. Like, obviously, that oh, was no. brought up as being a, a bit slow. And no, it's not the best part of the film. But I, for <laughs> one, I, for one, love seeing a bit more representation of African Americans and Asian people in the Star Wars <laughs> universe. And I dare you to argue against that, Paul. No, <laughs> not going to argue against that. They could have still created a compelling plot or one that was remotely interesting or actually influenced things in any meaningful way. And I think they're very touching romance. It is obviously (laughs) um, a big theme of this film that does come to a head at the end. You know, again, like in in another film, you would have them hooking up at the end. Like, yeah, they both realise they love each other. But you know what? 
This is, let's do something that's a bit more realistic. Like you've got Rose madly in love with Finn and he's like, no, I'm sorry. I like you as a friend. And that's okay too, Paul. (laughs) (laughs) Certainly is like, okay, my friend. I can't argue with that point, Dean. (laughs) (laughs) You're making this too easy for me, Paul. All right. We're done here. Uh, Man. I, I did come into this uh, this whole debate, and, and even before we started, Dean's like, "You're just going to not pick me because it's me." And I'm like, "No, I'm going to come in, you know, fresh mind, fresh eyes." And uh, I'm sorry, Paul, but Dean mopped the floor with you on that one. Woo! Yes, <laughs> I've got nothing to add. I'm not responding to that. <laughs> <laughs> Silence. <laughs> uh, are you okay, Paul? <laughs> I, I will live. I reckon. Just. Hey. Hey, Dean, Dean, just watch out for the free-for-all, mate, because you man. <laughs> He's got his notes. Yeah, you're going to get blasted, Dean. Oh, fuck, I can't wait. <laughs> All right, that brings us to our third round here. It's one apiece at the moment, and it's into the techs. And we've got, for the positive side, Topher against Sam on the Negatrons. So we'll start with Topher this time around. Go for it, bud. Thank you. Um, so this film, it's got a budget of $300 million. You Like, let's be honest, if this thing didn't look shit hot, you'd be upset. But we know that that's not an absolute lock. Like, we've seen DC films. We know it's possible for a big budget film to look like absolute balls, (laughs) which The Last Jedi does not. It is a slick production. One of the opening shots is Luke's hand. Well, what used to be Luke's hand. And it looks incredible. It looks like a tactile, functioning bit of kit as compared to, say, Cyborg or what Tony Stark's uniform increasingly became as films ticked by in the MCU. Then... We're lucky in this film to have someone as accomplished as Johnson at the helm because the camera movements in this film are so slick. The way he winds through First Order ships in that initial battle rather than just plonking the camera in a corner and saying, all right, have it play out. He does some actually rather Spielbergian things where a shot might start as a mid shot and then becomes a close up and is just hugely more engrossing than if we're honest a bunch of the direction in the original trilogy, which we all love so much. Um, That extends to the lighting as well. Like, this film just looks so much more interesting and has completely superior dramatic effect in terms of lighting compared to other blockbusters. Like, you look at the increasingly grey tones of the MCU and it just does not grip you like the look of this film. Um, That extends into things, things like costuming in this film. We're used to, like, the first film won an Oscar for costuming. People's kit in these movies have always looked kick-ass. It still does. Who does not want to roll around the house in Snoke's golden <laughs> dressing gown? That thing is awesome. I love it. Um, there's a there's a tightrope that needs to be treaded here with, um, with, with, with the technical things in this film. Things need to look like pretend scanners looked like at least somewhat in 1977, despite the fact that that look is, is now completely outdated. And the, thing, the, the instrumentation we see in ships in The Last Jedi, they really do echo that original trilogy while being updated so that they don't stick out like the dog's proverbials. Um, one, there's, there's, I'm going to bring up a moment in the film I don't like, Mary Poppins Leia. No, no one's here for it. But Johnson does slide in this cool little bit of foreshadowing in a moment that I otherwise don't like. Where, where Leia glides back into the ship, she actually splits the hologram of the supremacy, foreshadowing what Holdo will later do like an absolute fucking boss. Johnson also coaxes out of, of Hamill his, his greatest performance as Luke. Here's a guy who doesn't even agree with what he's doing, which is fine because you're an actor, you're the director's tool, so just do what you're fucking told, mate. And he's outstanding in this film. The end. Here's the end of this film with Luke looking out on the sunset, echoing beautifully the twin sunset shot of A New Hope, again, bravo Johnson, is spine-tingling. I, like, I don't cry in movies because I'm half machine like Darth Vader. But if I was a functioning human with emotions like Billy, I'd have fucking wept. I guarantee you. So, Johnson, I just... I, I'm so happy this film got handed to someone who, following on from The Force Awakens, which... I'm completely okay with The Force Awakens being a retread because after the prequels, Disney went, you know what, just have a Star Wars film. And we all fucking loved it. But we don't then need to just continue down that path. Johnson had the balls to give people something new and knocked it out of the park with the behind-the-camera action. Over to you, Sam. 
Fuck, have we watched different movies? What the hell? <laughs> I mean, look, look, obviously it is Star Wars. Yes, you're right. They spent $300 million on the budget. But I'm going to put it this way. You can put jam on bread and you can call it a sandwich, but you know what? It's still bread. And that's exactly what the production levels are on this film. They're jams that fail to cover a mouldy lump of decaying bread that's underneath it. Uh, first off, the CGI. I'd say it's ropeable at best. I mean, J.J. Abrams took a leaf out, and I know this is going to give Paul a hard on, but he took a leaf out of the Mad Max Fury Road book and combined practical <laughs> effects with a little bit of CGI. In this movie, they've completely gone the other way. Everything looks digitized. Even all the aliens in Canto Bite, they all look like cutscenes from a PlayStation 2 game. And then there's the animal creatures, aka the cash grabs, aka the knockoff minions. Whether it be the horse goats, the crystal foxes, or the porgs, they all look horrendous too. And they haven't been given a 3D rendering in a way that gives them the appearance that they physically occupy a space. It's also clear that the actors didn't have an accurate physical representation of what they were supposed to be working with in the scenes with these creatures because they all behave differently to them. The worst of all is the horse goat creatures that look like nightmares. At one point when Finn and Rose are on one and they're riding on one, the motion and movements are barely representative of the movements of the creature that they're supposed to be riding. It reminds me of like the old Star Trek movies when they get smashed into the left-hand side of the bloody ship, but then they all fall in different directions. And okay, okay, sure the scene of them riding through the town looks kind of cool, with sparks and flames and shit going everywhere for no discernible reason, but it's again, it's just jam on fucking bread. It doesn't work. Showing us something with a subtle touch is a lot better than forcing something into our eye sockets, and that's what these scenes become. They become excessive amounts of self-wank special effects. Now, talking about the flames, whoever was responsible for digitizing these clearly was getting paid per square inch as they filled every screen pretty much in every scene they were in. And, like, you know, it's even when it's unnecessary. Like, you know, I mentioned the flames and sparks you get during Canto Bright. Sure, you get the flames and spark when Holdo Kamikaze is a ship for another ship. Sure, that makes sense. But what I can't understand is why I'd have them during the throne room scene where Snoke, Ray, and Kylo are all having their final showdown. They haven't even been kamikaze yet, but as soon as the showdown starts with, you know, the Red Guards and Ray and Kylo, there's just flames everywhere. There's like fire pits around the building and shit like that. There's no reason for them to be there. And again, it's desperately just trying to wow you with big effects so that your brain doesn't engage to what's happily, actually happening on the on the screen. And uh, the kamikaze scene, okay, sure, it's the defining moment of the film that looks really cool. But if you stop and think about it for a second, are you going to tell me that this is possible now? Why hasn't anyone in the Empire, First Order, or Rebels ever thought of doing it before? They could have kamikaze a few old ships through the Death Star. We also know that as soon as somebody invents something, the military tries and finds a way to use it for war. These guys are effectively rebel insurgent. This is just complete bollocks that they haven't tried the ship before. Literally the last movie before this one, the last Star Wars movie, Rogue One had a bunch of ships try to jump to hyperspace from Scarif, and they ploughed straight into the side of Darth Vader's Star Destroyer. And guess what? Nothing happened to the Star Destroyer. Not a single thing. They exploded on its shields. There was no bollocks domino effect that wiped out 90% of the fleet. There was nothing. These shots are failures because they need you to be stupid. Some other aspects of the production didn't work for me very well is the practicality and continuity of some of these costumes. You've got Ray hanging out on an island in three-quarter shorts and a vest while Luke is covered in blankets. To that I say bollocks. If you grew up on a desert planet, discount Tatooine or wherever Ray grew up, you aren't used to rain and cold. I mean, look at Luke. He's covered from head to toe in bloody shoals and blankets and shit. You cover the hell up. You're going to freeze your tits off. Is the movie trying to imply to us that Ray had literally no other <laughs> costumes for where, for her environment that she was supposed to be in. But maybe she does have magic clothes. I mean, we're talking about continuity. In one scene, she falls into a well. She comes out. She's covered in... Or her hair's completely wet, but her clothes are completely dry. And if we're going to talk costumes, you know, you mentioned the this bloody whatever the fuck Snoke was wearing. Let's talk about costumes. Let's talk about the one scene where Adam Driver takes his shirt off and reveals to us that he's wearing a pair of big black nappies. <laughs> I mean, what the fuck was that? And then finally, oh, well, I've got a little bit more, but talking about no substance to a shot, let's take the final showdown with Luke and Emo Ren. They've literally just unloaded everything they have on this hologram, and the site isn't a crater. Even better, all the salt that's mostly still intact there, so that they can do their fun little foot stuff and reveal the red underneath it. You know, there's, again, it's just jam on bread. It's supposed to look cool, but there's nothing really there. I mean, just have some recollection of what logic is. Finally, I'm going to talk about the score. There's nothing memorable about it. I love John Williams. I love the original score. And the reason why I find this so unoriginal and is just because it's recycled. And the reason for this that I've managed to look up is that Ryan Johnson didn't actually bother to meet with John Williams and do a spotting session of what sort of music he'd like for different parts of the film, which is what every director before him in a Star Wars movie has done. Ryan Johnson just sent him a temp track of music from his previous film scores and said, hey, here you go, use this. 
So, in summary, whatever cool parts the movie has are ultimately I done by requiring you to be stupid. Look, I get that this film's a suspension of disbelief, but these are insanely huge jumps of logic in order for you to agree with them. And I've just got to ask you, Hendo, are you that stupid? Are you that stupid? All right, fuck back. Someone buy this man a case of beers. <laughs> Uh, choosing to care about meeting with the GOAT. That's hilarious. If I'm coaching a basketball team that Michael Jordan's on, I'm not going to spend time on him. He knows what he's doing. I'm so glad you brought up the Mineral Planet because I that was in my notes and I somehow skipped it. What, what a kick-ass bit of design. Again, so many things in this film that are just so eye-catchingly brilliant. Snoke's throne room. What a boss set. What an absolute boss set. That thing what, is with flames stunning. going off everywhere the design, and shit like that happening for no reason. The design of those red guards, <laughs> again, echoing back to the original trilogy, but doing something with them. They're there. We, okay, we've seen them before in the Emperor's Throne Room where they got dismissed and didn't get to do anything. They just kind of stood around looking cool, like, let's be honest, Boba Fett. Um, in this film, we get an awesome sequence. With the entire Throne Room sequence is one of the most... <laughs> brilliantly action-packed bits of film in any Star Wars is it? movie ever. Is it really? Really. You go back, I've watched you it. go back and watch that again, my friend, because you've got people running off into the middle of nowhere for no reason. <laughs> you've got a dude taking a swipe at Ray's uh, stomach, and then just before it hits her, it like launches a meter above the air to go over top of her head. You've got guys flying yep. backwards for no reason. There's no force kicks or anything like that. But the best of all is that one scene, we've got a showdown between Ray and another dude. The other dude snaps his thing into two different knives and comes at Ray. And then they, you know, have a bit of a scrap. They interlock, and they've got their arms cut up, and you know, interlocked above their heads. Ray's got a lightsaber above his head. The other guy's got his knife above his head. And what does he do with the other knife? Nothing, because it's not there anymore. They part back from the shot, and the other knife has disappeared. You watch that scene again. If, it is fucking horrendous for continuity. And if we really want to analyze the fight with the crazy eighty-eight, the bride dies in ten seconds. At some point, you go, "We're going to direct some action, and it's going to look cool." Please tag me in. Please <laughs> no, tag but me it in. doesn't look cool. That's the problem. <laughs> the, the fight choreography in it is horrendous. Like, it's literally three dudes just swinging at Ray, and then she's like blocking them. But as you notice, like, the dudes aren't actually swinging at Ray. They're swinging a meter behind her. There's a guy that does like a four, like a 720 bloody spin as he comes into like Kylo. Me and two of my mates, when we were 14 years old, got into a room of lightsabers and we started having a play fight to see what happens. One of us tried to just do a spin and that kid ended up in fucking hospital. You don't show I your back to viral. somebody. Even if they've got a plastic lightsaber, let alone a fucking proper, you know, like proper lightsaber. It's horrendous. Thanks for reminding me of the aliens in Canto Bite as well, because there are photos of, of those aliens on set because they're not CGI. Oh, you go back and have a look at it again, my friend. You absolutely are. <laughs> You're trying to tell me that that little thing that was putting fucking coins into BB-8 wasn't a fucking digitized God knows what. Yes, there is CGI in the film. Yeah, there is. There's CGI in the film, but it's good when it looks good. And you mentioned the budget, like they spent $300 million on this. They spent $100 million on fucking, like, oh, how much did they spent on Blade Runner 2049? $150 million. That one cinemato- cinematography it didn't, at the Oscars. This one didn't even get nominated. Yeah, not everyone has Roger Deakins, no, I know, man. I get that. But best production design, didn't even get nominated. Best sound mixing, best sound editing, got nominated for both. Lost both to Dunkirk. You know, like, it's, I get that this is the best part of the movie, but still there's a whole lot of holes in it. It just doesn't hold water. I'm just glad we were up against each other because you could remind me of other things that were good. (laughs) Better of opinion, my friend. (laughs) All right, I'm going to call it there, guys. Uh, Let's see. Uh, Billy, you did have... uh, (laughs) Billy, Topher, you had... uh, (laughs) Topher, you had some uh, good arguments to start off with, you know, the the budget and the way it looked, the way it was shot. Uh, Costumes looked good in that. Uh, Sam, your jam analogy really confused the shit out of me when you said it at the start, but uh, after you said it a couple more times throughout your arguments, uh, I started to uh, understand what you were talking about. You did bring up a lot of good points uh, along the way in regards to uh, the way the CGI was shot and um, them not looking at certain characters because they're not there, looking a little fake. Uh, I think the the, tip, the tipping point really was the the rebuttal later on in regards to the, the fight in the Snoke room and how all the extras on the sides and that were doing really random shit and there wasn't too much rebuttal back because of that uh, that I warranted was worthy. So, Sam, you take the point. Thank you. Woo. I was holding that in well, the hole. That was my <laughs> ace up the sleeve. But we're into our final round here. It's the Negatrons at two to the Positive Posse one. But this round is worth two points, so it's basically a big free-for-all for who's going to win this debate. So have at it, be kind, be gentle, and uh, go for it. 
Sounds like Duty has been chafing at the beach. <laughs> yeah, come, on. come on, Duty, what do you got? <laughs> all right, all right, all right. Now, I mean, no, no disrespect to anyone, but I've written down what you've been saying. And Dean, I'm starting with you. You've said Ryan Johnson subverts expectations in this film, but he doesn't know the actual Star Wars fucking universe or lore that's in it. So, an example, this film... T- Kylo Ren goes to shoot uh, Leia and Admiral fucking Akbar. let's not start about that, who are on the bridge of their ship, and he decides not to, but a TIE fighter shoots a proton torpedo. Now, a proton torpedo, for those of you who <laughs> oh don't God. know what they <laughs> are... Come on, mate. Please stop. Is- <laughs> <laughs> so proton torpedo is, is an energy warhead that releases clouds of high velocity proton particles. Now we see proton torpedoes missing the exhaust port of the Death Star and hitting uh, hitting walls and portions around the trench, and it physically shakes the Death Star. And seeing a proton torpedo hit the bridge of the Star Destroyer, and everyone just fly out of it. Bitches be vaporized and turned into dust, not just flying out going. Whoosh, out of a fucking window. It doesn't work she like that. She has the force uh, yes. duty. The force. No, no. You're vaporised. You're fucking No, she dead. force bubbled before the vaporising oh, happened. Classic Pull your tongue out of my <laughs> she, knew, she knew it was coming because of the force. Let's talk, it's like spider Let's talk about the Praetorian Guards. The midi told her it was happening. <laughs> let's talk about the Praetorian Guards. They are Snoke's version of the Royal Guards that the Emperor bad has. And they are badass. They are awesome. And yes, not they actually... Actu- they give two force users a really good run for their money. They are badass. Now, now let me hit you with some quick facts. Now, the uh, the Praetorian Guards, of course, are the Snoke's version of them. Now, the Royal Guards were the Emperor's version, who Darth Vader did not fuck with. There is a deleted scene in Episode Six where Vader tries to go back onto the Emperor's throne room, and the Praetorian Guards point their force pikes at him and say, you're not allowed in. And he goes, fine, fair enough. I'm not going in there, fair enough. And this film takes right place after Force Awakens and fucking Rey, who has barely handled a lightsaber, can take on a room full of these when Vader can't do one by himself. That makes absolutely no fucking sense. And let's talk about that scene together. Like uh, the, uh, the, the fight uh, sort of ends with uh, Kylo and Rey force pulling for the lightsaber going, oh, you know, Kylo wants it, Rey wants it. If we go back to episode seven, Maz Kanata says, the lightsaber calls to you. Uh, Kylo tries to pull it out of the snow and it goes flying past Kylo and Ray catches it. So how come when they f- both force pull it, it sits in the middle? Because he the wasn't at full beams in Force Awakens. No, no. The exactly. saber calls to Ray. The saber doesn't sit in the middle. You don't need they to think all- about he- it for long. He already tried to force pull it out of the snow on Star Killer Base, and it went straight to race. So theoretically, because dead. the saber calls to her, no, no, he he took on he took on Ben before yeah. he did that. Not Ben, sorry, he took on Finn, yeah, and he kicked the right, shit dude. out of Finn. You're embarrassing <laughs> yourself. He kicked, he kicked the shit out of Finn, and then when Finn drops the saber, Ray picks it up because the saber calls him. And this one, it sits in the middle and snaps in half. And if we take a look back to what uh, to what Topher was saying in regards to Luke dying because of the twin sons, yes, it was emotional. Yes, I cried, but definitely not because of fuck. And Ryan Johnson. It's because of John Williams' throwback. Oh wait, so John Williams is good. Now. <laughs> no, no, John Williams. Great this score. Is the I could worst. not agree with you this more. Dude, is, yeah, it's such the worst score. And I have to admit, I teared up as well. This is an emotional triumph of a Fuck film. You're talking I'm yeah. really yeah. happy we're finally on the same music, page, dude. And there is absolutely nothing new in this film at all. The only thing that what? works for this film... How can you say there's nothing new in this film? That's ridiculous. We've spent the last on, 40 dude. minutes discussing all of the new wise, things. Okay, okay. musical score-wise, give me something new yeah, that's in on. this film yeah, right yeah, now. Yeah, yeah. Go on. Give me a new score that John Williams worked on in this film. Everything is recycled from The Force Awakens and the exactly. original trilogy. We even get the TIE fighter chase from the Death Star inside Crate. We get fucking. We get the princess's theme from Episode Four. We get fucking the twin sons theme when Luke dies. There is nothing new within you this film. You cannot beat perfection, duty. They have handpicked the absolute best moments of scores from other Star Wars films to create this sort of best of version. I yeah, love it. Yeah, really it. original. But really genius. original. Can we talk about like? Can, Duty, can Duty take a breath? And can we talk about <laughs> maybe the greatest decision Ryan Johnson made? Not coming back for the next one. Which is that Ray came from nothing. <laughs> yes. And that that the hero of the story yet. is relatable to everyone because we can all be this person. He ignored the fact that the galaxy is a big place. Everyone's not related. Do you honestly believe, though, that Kylo's thing is Yeah, how is would Kylo real? know that? Yeah, fucking how would so. Kylo know? I absolutely hope they do not I will retcon that because it would be in a the next fucking episode, shame. She turns out to be a fucking Skywalker. That would be terrible. I, I, I honestly think... It's it's clone like that's the only thing I can think of. But there's absolutely no way that it was your parents sold you because they wanted to get blasted. It's brilliant. Like there's why would Kylo Ren know that? Again, these are massive plot holes. Why would Kylo Ren know exactly. that? Exactly because she knows. Because deep down she knew. 
and he was tapped into it. We've already it. seen how much he, she can push him out of her head. So how would he be able to sneak his fucking way in there? Because it's Adam Driver yeah. and deep down we all want him in us. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's going to get retconned so hard in this next film. But we're not debating the next film. As I said, we've got to focus on this one. And what also, they did in this one worked. Dean, to your point, you said it was it was new. It was it's, it was you know it was something that no one ever thought of. But about what two minutes ago, you saying this is the greatest hits of Star Wars for so the score? Yes, new. we were discussing the score yeah. duty. I can actually separate it's elements an of the film. It's an absolute tightrope you've got to work between echoing things that people love. No one's while saying it's easy, it. duty. But using the old score again. I mean, it's, come it's on, that's not- fucking lazy. That is really lazy. I'll, I'll tell John Williams you said so. Oh, go ahead. <laughs> Ryan Johnson did not go to John Williams to say, like, this is the emotion I want to bring. Like, when you see Kylo Ren appear in episode seven, you feel that sort of that homage to Vader, but also this new dark power sort of theme surging through it. And same thing when you listen to Snoke's throne room in episode seven. There is a great sort of power going through it. But this is literally just ambiance and and playing homage and that's it there's nothing new to it at all and the the film the two main weapons of this film uh death star it's a death star cannon on a star destroyer and it's miniaturized death star tech there's nothing new about this film and you guys you guys have gone (laughs) on did they have did they have a mini death star in the other films that i didn't know about but every weapon is miniature Death Star's t- Death Star technology. Oh my god, they have. In fairness, a Death it's Star not the first Star Wars ship. film to recycle the Death Star, is it, Duty? I mean, correct me if I'm wrong here. Hang on, hang on. We're only focusing yeah, on. Yeah, we're this only film. talking about this film huh? here. <laughs> we're, only, we're only focusing on this film, and this film has absolutely nothing new. You can't except, have it both uh, ways. <laughs> No, you, yeah, but you can't say that this is this blew the audience's mind because, you know, no one was expecting it. No one was expecting this because it is rinse, repeat. You're pulling the best bits, but the best bits don't fit together. You're literally picking up a piece of Lego and a jigsaw puzzle and a painting and trying to put them together on a fucking dot-to-dot drawing. It, n- none of those pieces <laughs> yeah, exactly. go together. You've pulled parts from a fucking Honda and you're putting it on a bloody Daewoo washing machine. It it's doesn't so true. work. Like you guys have gone on about subverting expectations and all that sort of shit. I'm going to drive to work tomorrow. If I get smashed into by fucking another truck, is that subverting my expectations? Sure. Yes. <laughs> Do I want it to happen? Fuck no. I would hope so. <laughs> oh, I've, I've got more, but I'm, I'm just, there's no point. I think, yeah, I mean, we've gone over, there's just so many like plot and inconsistencies and shit like that in this film, you know what I mean? It's just, oh, it's like even even the recycling part, like it's it's a chase scene and like it worked really well in the very first Star Wars and you hope that we all saw of a Star Destroyer chasing down another ship and that was 90 seconds long and fuck, we knew what was going to happen from that film. We were like, oh shit, this is going to be an enjoyable fucking thrill ride. And this, it literally is just a slow, slow chase and it multiple times during this, the First Order or whatever have a chance to actually end the battle like multiple different times. They could have sent X yep. amount of little fucking tiny spaceships after them to get them. They could have hyper jumped to just in front of them and then just come around and turn around and blow them away. Like as soon as you start thinking about it, and that was a lot of my point, as soon as you start thinking about it, it's just like, yeah, it looks cool, but what, what, where's the substance behind this? The, the, the point in the film as well, like Kylo Ren is, is out trying to, he's with two TIE fighters and he's trying to take down the, the resistance ship and fucking Hux comes up and says, you're getting out of comms range, you need to pull back. I'm sorry, <laughs> fucking... Jedi's were talking from Kashyyyk to bloody Mygito to the Jedi Council on Coruscant. Oh, you're getting out of cell phone reception range. You got to turn back and plug back into. The- you are in the essentially the Emperor's personal Star Destroyer. You're in Snoke's personal fucking Star Destroyer. You have a fleet of a hundred thousand fucking Tie Fighters. Swarm them out there. You will literally don't do this. They're going to run out of fuel. The only reason fuel was put into this film is because then you can introduce you can use fuel again in the Solo film, which honestly is a lot better than this film. Oh, yeah, I'd agree with that. And talking about Holdo, why did she not tell Poe Dameron any... I mean, you guys mentioned that she didn't have time to do that. You've got a reckless guy who literally, 10 seconds before you come back on the ship, who was out there, you know, blowing up a ship, sacrificing all his bloody other spaceships and shit like that. You know how dangerous this guy is. You know how problematic this guy is. Exactly, which is why you cut him out of the no, plan. No, you it's don't. why you bring him in and make him, yeah, you know, you're, you're such a rebel. Let me tell you what, <laughs> what my plan is. No, you sort of think, you know what, I'm going to keep this to myself a bit because this guy is already been shown to go against what his yeah, superiors what want to do. Yeah, monumentally fucking that, that, Like, I understand what? not telling it. Poe po is a bloody dick to this woman as well, I must say. Po- when they first interact, he is not... He has no 
social skills with yeah, her at all. Exactly. And she realizes that. She's supposed yeah, to nah. be a smart vice admiral or whatever. She should look at the guy and go, okay, this guy is uncontrollable. I need to put him in a fucking room or whatever. I need to speak to him. I need to explain to him what we're going to do. Otherwise, this guy's going to cause a mutiny. And guess what? He fucking causes a mutiny. They would have gone away with her plan if, sh- they, if she had told him. You know what I mean? Like Finn and bloody um, Rose wouldn't have gone off to Canto Bite. They wouldn't have communicated on the way back. Poe wouldn't have told them their plan. Fuck, uh, Snoke or Ren or whoever the hell got it out of them, got it out of them. They wouldn't have known. They wouldn't have known those spaceships were there. All they took was Holdo to go, hang on, wait a sec. This guy's a fucking firecracker. I just need to put him out a bit. Here we go. This is what we're going to do. This guy's, this, guy's a, yeah, this guy's a firecracker and the entire resistance fucking rally to Poe. Let's tell Poe what's going on. So then if anyone else tries to go, I don't like this, Poe, let's rebel. Poe can go, guys, let's give it a minute and let's see what's going on. I have faith in her rather than just going, no, I don't like this. I'm not allowed to sit at the kid at the parents' table. I have to sit at the kids' table with fucking, <laughs> s- you know, Snap Wegsley and the guy from Lost. Well, I like that the good guys fail in their mission, okay? Because, again, you don't expect it. Like, why would you want the good guys to always be succeeding? We have this whole <sighs> side plot about these guys trying to complete a mission. They fail. Like, that happens, yeah. okay? The good guys can't just always win. They fail and then... It doesn't make the plot they useless. They fail and Deuce Ex Machina, a fucking spaceship tears through a ship, wipes out a thousand fucking stormtroopers and leaves Finn and Rose still alive with Phasma, who's been completely that could yeah. wasted. And, uh, and let's talk, uh, I'm, I'm, call, I'm calling it here. The Negatron's just completely mopped the floor with that one. I was, I was trying, to, trying to get something out of the positive here, but well, every time they brought something like in, internet culture. If you just get more animated and don't stop uh, you've talking, lost, yeah. you've lost, I, I disagree with you. Lost your call here. I think. Just of course, you disagree. More, you're on the, you're on the team. They lost. said more. It doesn't mean the points were better, Hendo. No, nah, I, I think uh, Negatron's. You, you bought it. Uh, you bought out the facts. God. They had the I was bored for everything. of people ripping on this film when it came out. I'm more bored now. <laughs> well done, Negatrons. You win. Thank you. Cheers. Well done, Judy. Well done, Sam. Thank you. I was a passenger. Happy to admit it. Uh, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but the reality is, this film's absolutely fine. I'm, I'm right where I'm right where Daniel is. <laughs> Well, what does what does everyone else think about the film? Uh, it's not the worst Star Wars film, but it's it's in the bottom three. Yeah, I'm, I'm with you there, mate. Oh, true thoughts. I was delighted again watching it during the week. Like I liked it when it came out, and then watching it again this week, I was like, yeah, this this is really good. Yeah, the the casino stuff is hard to watch. <laughs> I think it is. I like. I am so not here for Canto Bite. So this time I sat there with yeah, <laughs> this stopwatch on my phone. It's ten minutes. It feels oh, like an eternity. It felt like thirty. <laughs> They, they got to get there though, and we got to talk about them getting there. All that stuff adds up more than yeah, ten minutes. Not, so. Yeah, not again. Not here for it. Well, I think what we've seen so far over two debates here is that it's much more easier and fun to be on the negative side. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah I'm, I'm not against people. Like, like, I, I, that's the thing about Star Wars. Like certain people love certain films. Like some people think this is the best Star Wars film ever made, and that's great because it gets. It gets like yeah, there are things that you know I don't necessarily like this film compared to say episode six, but it's like it's still a common ground that you like Star Wars, and it's still it's it's one of these like film franchises that sort of as well brings people together and just chatting about their favorite things and what they do and they don't because like. Because people having- really do do it in a really healthy yeah. manner. <laughs> some people do. Some people do. I will say, I've met friends through just loving Star Wars, and some people are just right proper fuckholes. And then yeah. I'm like, cool, you do your thing. Yeah, I'm when not we started interested. our podcast, we were like, whatever we do, we don't want to be three fucking white nerds on the internet complaining about Star Wars. <laughs> Thank God, there's seven <laughs> of us. It's brilliant. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the, um, yeah. One of the, one of the people that loves this movie is my wife. She thinks it's the best Star Wars movie. In fact, it's the only Star Wars movie she likes. When we walked out of the like the screening, I Whoa. looked at her and I was like, what? Jeez. She's like, yeah, I love that film. And I was like, oh, I didn't really care for it. And she's like, it's my favorite. I was like, better than Empire. And then she turned to talk to me and I just clasped my hands over my ears and la, 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 la went running down the stairs. <laughs> I was like, I don't want to fucking hear the answer to this. I don't want to hear the answer. <laughs> Starts filling out divorce exactly. paperwork. <laughs> Well, I think we can agree. Uh, I think we can all agree on one thing. We're all pretty excited to see episode nine coming out, I'm right? Pumped. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yep. This is Star Wars season right now with Mandalorian, uh, Last Jedi, and then uh, Rise of Skywalker. Yes. Fantastic. I also just realized that everyone has now won a debate except for me. <laughs> <laughs> I, ta- I take it back. <laughs> sure, there'll be another opportunity. Sure, the, the next one, Hendo. Next yeah. one. Uh, I'm the curse. Anyone who gets on the same team as me now knows they're going to lose. <laughs> but no, that was a really good debate. Thanks, everyone, for getting together and having another you know debate about uh, a very divisive film. Why don't we go around the room and get everyone to say where to find your podcast? What about you, Paul? Uh, Countdown Movie and TV Reviews. Google that. We'll come up just about everywhere. But uh, thanks, Hendo, for doing this and for organising and then doing the edit because that's the real hero move right there. (laughs) 
<laughs> no worries, Sam. What about yeah, you? Yeah, uh, movie reviews and Twenty Qs podcast currently on a hiatus, but we'll be back very soon, probably with some of these guys that you've listened to during this episode. Uh, find us everywhere. Just search out movie reviews in, and we'll probably be the first one that comes up. And uh, yeah, thanks for hosting and editing, like Paul said. It's very much appreciated, Hendo. You're the man. Oh, we've already won. Oh, okay. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> Take it back. Dude, what about you? Uh, well, yeah, if you want to hear about more of this angry nerd, you can find me on Shaken Not Nerd. Uh, and uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, thank you very much again, Hendo. It's, it's, it's a blast. I'm real sweaty. Um, yeah, I, I had fun. <laughs> and Billy and Topher? We, uh, we watched a thing. If you Google that, I'm sure will come up. Been a pleasure again, gentlemen. Dean, you want to say it? Sure, uh, we're from the IMDB Journey podcast and uh, yeah, just Google us, we're everywhere. All right, and thank you everyone for checking out the episode. 